Since the first day man discovered that oil and air would burn, he's been trying to find a more efficient way to do it. Looking at oil burners from the past, you can see a wide variety of designs. Many of them focused on improving the flame pattern at the combustion head. They are all characterized by a flame pattern with a base located a good distance from the surface of the burner head and not held in place or retained onto the head. The mixing of fuel and oil was not consistent and consequently there were fuel rich and fuel lean zones. The tendency of the flame to oscillate in a forward and backward motion often resulted in an audible combustion pulsation under some adverse conditions. The addition of a combustion chamber gave the flame a target wall which recirculated the flame back along the sides of the chamber to the flame base. The flame retention combustion head introduced a highly efficient flame pattern. There are two types of flame retention heads, fixed and variable. Here is an example of a fixed head flame retention burner. It's characterized by a secondary opening preset to a specific opening size for a specific firing rate range. The variable head design allows the head to move forward and backward against a ring in order to change the secondary opening according to the firing rate required. Generally, a fixed head is ideal for most applications. The proper selection for a replacement burner begins right here. The rating plate of the furnace or boiler usually will show the firing rate or the number of gallons per hour required. After pulling the old burner, consult the appliance manufacturer's installation instructions if available for the correct replacement burner model. Begin your installation with a good cleaning of the heating system, starting with the chimney and flue pipe, including the heat exchanger and the vestibule. Because the combustion chamber is vital to the combustion process, inspect it thoroughly. Older stainless steel chambers should be protected from high temperatures. This is quickly and conveniently done by using a soft fiber chamber. Some newer stainless steel chambers are designed and tested by their manufacturer for use with today's modern burners. If that's the case, a lining is not necessary. When selecting the burner, the old fuel pump is a good place to start. Replace the pump with the same type that was on the burner that you removed, or refer to the chart which the pump manufacturer provides with the pump. A single stage fuel pump installed with a one pipe gravity feed supply is very common with residential installations. If the fuel supply tank is below the burner, use a single stage fuel pump in lift conditions up to 10 feet. Use a two stage fuel pump when lift exceeds 10 feet. Next, check the electrical supply to the burner. You may need to provide a new conduit from the electrical panel to the appliance limit controls and burner. Make sure the thermostat has an adjustable heat anticipator set to match the new primary control amp draw so that the burner cycles for the proper length of time. Use a small screwdriver if you need to adjust the anticipator setting. Clean the oil lines if necessary. A hand pump is one method. The fuel lines themselves should be a continuous length of copper tubing. It is absolutely essential that no compression fittings be used. Flared fittings are the only acceptable type. And make sure all fittings are in accessible locations. Teflon tape is not suitable for oil lines and will often void pump manufacturer's warranties. If you use joint compound, keep it out of the pipes themselves. And finally, to minimize noise, fuel lines should not run against ceiling joists or against the appliance. Make sure there is a fuel line shutoff valve on the supply line with indoor tanks. A fusible shutoff valve may be required by local codes. If you have any doubt, check with the proper local authorities. A generous capacity filter should be installed on the supply line for easy servicing. Next, measure the depth from the inside chamber wall to the outside mounting plate surface to determine the air tube length. Remember, the tube must be recessed one quarter inch to prevent overheating. There are several types of flanges, all with their own gaskets, that you can select to mount the burner to the appliance. Remove the burner from the box, also unpacking the air tube and the electrode assembly. 
add the gasket and flange to the air tube. Then mount the air tube on the burner. Put the nozzle in the electrode assembly. To set the Z dimension, insert the electrode assembly into the air tube. Then, using the T-gauge, move the electrode assembly forward in the air tube to the correct setting. Add the knurled nut to attach the electrode assembly and the nozzle to the fuel line. Now lock the flange in place using an Allen wrench on the set screws. In this case, a 5 and 3 8 inch insertion depth. Lift the replacement burner to the appliance and mount it securely to the front plate. The air tube should point slightly downward into the combustion chamber. This allows oil to run out with every cycle should after drip occur. To check the air tube downward pitch angle, use a small level. After removing the level, insert the nozzle line electrode assembly. Tighten the knurled nut to the nozzle line electrode assembly, then connect the fuel line. After attaching the fuel line to the pump, attach the electrical wiring, making sure that all connections are secure. Now it's time to cycle the burner. Check the fuel supply lines, making sure the valves are open. Set the thermostat well above the room temperature. Set the air adjustment with the bulk air band closed and shutter partially open. Close the line switch to send power to the burner. Reset the safety switch on the primary control if it is locked out. The burner motor should start immediately. As soon as the burner motor starts, vent the fuel unit. Do this by attaching a clear plastic hose over the vent plug. Loosen the plug and collect the oil. When all the air is purged, tighten the plug. If the burner motor stops while venting, reset the switch to complete the venting procedure. If the burner locks out on safety, venting is probably not complete. Repeat the venting procedure until all air or froth is completely eliminated. To get a clean looking flame, loosen the lock screw and open the air shutter. If necessary, open the bulk air band. Reduce the air until the flame tips are just slightly smoky. Look through the viewport at the flame. Adjust the air control on the burner to get a clean looking flame. This is the rough setting you'll use while starting the burner to prevent sooting the heat exchanger. Later you'll do final adjustments using instruments. To check the draft, you'll need two sampling holes. The first is in the flue between the appliance and the flue draft regulator. The second is the hole in the inspection door above the flame level for the overfire measurement. Using the draft meter, adjust the draft regulator on the flue pipe to obtain an overfire draft of negative .02 inches water column reading. Check the burner manufacturer's instructions for the recommended setting if they are available. Next, take a stack draft reading. In this case, it is a negative .03 inches water column reading, which is higher than the overfire draft. This difference represents the restriction or pressure drop across the heat exchanger flue passages. Plug the draft or sampling hole in the fire door after the readings have been made. Wait five to ten minutes for the heating unit to warm up. This allows time for the heating system to reach steady state or a uniform operating temperature. Now you are ready to test the combustion for smoke, carbon dioxide or oxygen, and stack temperature. Detailed instructions for these measurements are given in volume 5. Before the test measurements are taken and the burner adjusted, tighten all locking screws in order to prevent erratic readings. Start and stop the burner several times to eliminate entrapped air from the nozzle line which could produce rumblings or pulsations and oil after drip. Set the thermostat to the desired room temperature. Test the limit switch to ensure that it will work in the event of an equipment failure. Your job is not over until you clean up the area and complete a form that shows the overall performance of the heating system. This form is a valuable record and an important tool for use during future servicing. 
This video training library is provided as a service to the oil heat industry. Brought to you by R.W. Beckett Corporation.